I'm Roger Ignazio, I'm from Puppet Labs. Um, today we're going to be talking about scaling Jenkins horizontally, um, statelessly, on top of Mesos and Marathon. Um, so really, uh, just a, a quick uh, bit about myself. Um, I'm part of the quality engineering team at Puppet Labs, and one of our missions is to be able to provide tooling, infrastructure, and services to the rest of the engineering org. Um, one of those services happens to be, you know, 15 or so different Jenkins clusters, uh, if you want to call that a service. Um, collectively, we like to refer to that as our CI system, even though it's a lot more than that. Um, anyway, uh, we did an experiment uh, last year to figure out what it would take to run something um, as stateful as a Jenkins master uh, on top of a stateless system such as uh, Marathon and Mesos. And uh, this is just what we learned and uh, some of the outcomes. So, like I said, a little bit about me. QE Automation Engineer over at Puppet Labs. I'm on Twitter, at Roger Ignazio. Um, I'm also the author of Mesos in Action with Manning Publications. Um, I think we've had about 400 or so copies sold um, in the last couple months. Uh, it's currently in pre-sale, so if you've bought it, thank you. If you haven't, um, you can get 40-something percent off with the code on the screen. Um, so I just want to talk about Puppet Lab's testing environment a little bit. Um, conventional methods for scaling Jenkins. Um, you know, typical scenarios, uh, master per team, master per project, one single master. Um, talk about our, our CI re-engineering project a little bit and uh, some of the motivations and uh, problems that we're trying to solve. Uh, we'll have a short demo. Um, everything's up in a Vagrant environment and uh, you'll be able to grab that code too if you want to play with it. Um, and then we'll have Q&A at the end. Uh, we should have a little bit of time left. Um, so I just want to start off, um, you know, it's been a long day, thank you for coming. Um, I know a lot of us want to go and, and grab a beer, uh, myself included, but um, you know, just before we get started, um, how many of you are Jenkins users right now? Okay, cool, so everybody in this room. So uh, you probably all know what I mean when, uh, when I say Jenkins is hard to scale. Um, and how many of you are also Mesos users? In production? Okay, so considerably less. All right, cool. So there'll be a... Um, I guess I'll, I'll glance over some of the, the Jenkins intro stuff since uh, you guys probably don't need to know that. But um, just a quick intro to Mesos for, for anyone who's not um, already familiar with it. It's a general purpose cluster manager. It really allows you to treat your data center or treat multiple machines as if they were one entity where individual resources such as CPU, memory, and disk are advertised directly to your applications or in Mesos terms, frameworks. Um, so with Jenkins, this really means that Jenkins either accepts an offer and it launches a new slave, or it rejects the offer and it does nothing. Uh, Marathon, uh, it's a Mesos framework developed by Mesosphere that provides uh, essentially a private platform as a service. Uh, it runs applications as if they were long-running Mesos tasks and provides automatic failover if one of those tasks happens to go down or a slave happens to go down. Um, yeah, and it allows you to easily scale to n instances. So if you have, you know, two instances of an app running and you suddenly want five, uh, it just launches those as, um, as new tasks. But along with that comes the problem of being able to maintain state since once that task is gone, uh, so is your build history and your job could fix. And I don't really need to intro Jenkins, um, but if there's anyone in here who's not familiar with Jenkins, um, it just allows you to continually build software projects and test software projects. Um, and it has a huge user community, over a thousand different plugins. And uh, some of those plugins we're gonna talk about um, in this talk and, and reuse them. So I just want to, um, you know, before we get into it, I want to talk about the scale that we're, we're testing software at Puppet, um, just to give you an idea of uh, some of the challenges we face. So we're launching about 4,000 to 5,000 builds a day across 75 different combinations of platforms, uh, releases, and architectures. So that's everything from uh, RHEL and Ubuntu to Windows and OS X and Solaris, and uh, if there are any AIX users in here, which probably not. Um, we even support AIX um, with Puppet Enterprise. Um, all of this testing is driven by 15 different statically partitioned Jenkins clusters um, with some mix of Jenkins being based on access control, team, project, function. Uh, somebody wanted a Jenkins for testing, so we gave them one. Uh, it, it's really just a, a sprawling static infrastructure. Um, but what that comes down to is about 1,300 executors um, across around 240 build machines. Um, 
We've also got some custom tooling. So I said that all of this is driven by Jenkins. Um, we have an automated testing framework called Beaker. Um, multi-cloud, multi-platform. It essentially allows devs and QAs to write their tests once and run them on any platform, on any cloud provider, uh, without needing to know about the underlying infrastructure. Uh, we also have a, a service called VMPooler. Um, because our customers are running Puppet on, you know, to build containers and to run it in VMs or run it on bare metal, uh, really we need to have unmodified kernels. We can't be doing uh, any of our integration testing in containers um, or in a, uh, you know, a pair of virtual setting. So VMPooler is sort of a pooling service uh, to our vSphere backend, and it allows us to have multiple different platforms of VMs just ready for checkout. So instead of waiting for our testing to provision, um, you know, 300 VMs uh, to start running uh, upgrade test scenarios, we can check those out immediately and then just have VMPooler uh, clone those back sometime in the future. So I think, um, let's see. Last month, we cloned about 120,000 disposable VMs, um, which saved us about 175 compute days of time during our test pre-suites. Um, our configuration management's a little haphazard. Uh, most of our job configs and scripts are still stored in Jenkins. Uh, sometimes the Jenkins jobs call scripts that are in the individual project repos, and then we even have a monolithic job configs repo that we use to configure our uh, Jenkins instances uh, via cron. Um, all of our infrastructure is managed by Puppet. I'm sure that's not really a surprise, um, or at least most of it. We don't manage the Jenkins configs per se, but we at least bring up the service. Um, and then as you could imagine, our reporting's uh, a little bit uh, sketchy too. We've got 15 different Jenkins UIs, which means we've got 15 different data stores, which means we've got 15 different APIs to hit if we want real-time status. Uh, so we've written a couple tools uh, called Clockin and Wayland to try to abstract some of that. And Clockin really gives us uh, historical run data and infrastructure metrics about all of our different Jenkins clusters. And Wayland allows real-time querying of all of our Jenkins masters on a per team, per project function, um, just hitting those APIs and bubbling the failures up to the top. Uh, just because we have certain projects, certain teams that would otherwise have to hit three, four, five different Jenkins instances to figure out if their software is actually shippable or not. Um, so I just wanted to touch on, you know, before we get into, you know, sort of the, the re-architecture stuff that, that uh, I'm pretty excited about, um, conventional methods for scaling Jenkins. Um, I mean, like I had alluded to, we've got two common deployments. We've got a single huge Jenkins with a single resource pool with all of your jobs. Um, or once you outgrow that or you start having, you know, problems with, uh, you know, polling taking up too many threads or, uh, you know, starting to be CPU bound, uh, you start breaking that out into master per team, per project or function. Um, the, the problem with breaking that out is it starts leading to static partitioning if you're not careful. Um, and Jenkins doesn't really provide a, a great way to avoid that, um, except with various Jenkins plugins. Um, obviously the masters are not highly available unless you do some crazy uh, sysadmin foo and you, you start setting up, you know, shared storage or DRBD with pacemaker and, you know, I've done it before, I don't want to do it again. Um, you know, it, it's especially complex when you're talking about having 15, 16 different Jenkins masters and now you have 15 or 16 different pairs of Jenkins masters and you're having to worry about failover in all these different places and you still have your static partitioning problem. It, you haven't actually solved resource utilization. Um, you can't easily load balance across these masters because all of the state is contained within them. Um, and I mean, let's face it, you know, we're here at MesosCon, static partitioning kills overall data center utilization. Uh, it's just a fact. So uh, just for the, the more visually inclined, I just wanted to, uh, to sort of give you a scenario. Um, so we've got an open source Jenkins, we have multiple uh, Jenkins that uh, make up Puppet Enterprise testing and, uh, and the build process and then you know, 13 or 14 later, we've got various different Jenkins for projects. So in this particular case, our open source Jenkins is about 90% utilized, um, so it's not too bad. Um, although we're probably pretty close to ship date on uh, Puppet Enterprise, we've got 140% utilization. You know, we've got 40 builds sitting in queue, developers are waiting to see if we can actually release the product or not. Um, and meanwhile, you know, 10, 11, you know, Project X Jenkins here is sitting at 0% utilized. Like, totally idle, it, all of its, uh, you know, CPU resources are just sitting there wasted. So I mean, what can we do about it? Well, 
there are various plugins for Jenkins to be able to support global resource pools. You know, we've got uh, things like Gearman, we've got EC2 plugins, vSphere, Mesos. Um, you know, I, I think there's a Kubernetes plugin for, uh, for Jenkins too, but I'm not entirely sure um, how mature that is. Um, I was just looking into it last week. But um, I mean, it, the problem too is, uh, you know, if you've got Jenkins slave labels on any of this stuff, you, you're, you, you've got static partitioning inception where you're partitioning your slaves after you've already partitioned them uh, on the infrastructure. Um, so let's take a look at the Mesos plugin real quick. So we've got the same Jenkins masters. They're still monoliths. They're still maintaining state. We have the same reporting problems. We have the same config problems. But they can talk to a Jenkins, or they can talk to a Mesos master. They can pull all of the resources from a single resource pool, as opposed to only being given the resources that they were assigned, um, and really improve utilization. So, you know, Project X Jenkins that was sitting zero percent idle before, you know, that's free CPU, that's free memory that can be used for the Puppet Enterprise testing. So, single pool of resources, but like I said, we still have the same problem: multiple URLs, multiple pl multiple sources of truth. So uh, one of the things we did um, was we started this uh, sort of CI re-engineering project um, to kind of figure out, um, you know, talking to dev, talking to QA, QE, managers, you know, what would their ideal system look like? You know, what is the data that we can provide to help them make better informed decisions so they can predict when we're actually going to be able to ship or if we're putting too many features in the product to be able to ship it in, you know, six or eight weeks. Um, Maybe more importantly, it's how we can make development workflows a little bit better. Um, you know, so what we did was um, we started off with some user stories uh, during these interviews. And if you haven't used user stories before, it follows a simple but pretty powerful concept where as a role, you want or need something so that outcome, with outcome being the measurable, and uh, want or need being the urgency or the priority. So just to run through a few of um, you know, the real user stories that we got internally at Puppet, um, as a developer, I want tests to be run against pull requests so that I have confidence in the code about to be merged. Like, yeah. <laughs> as a developer, I don't want to worry about the underlying infrastructure of the CI system. I mean, they're devs, they're not sysadmins, so we have entire teams for that. As a CI consumer, I want a central location to view all CI activity so I don't have to visit multiple URLs. Um, you know, if you can put the status of a build in one location and be able to bubble that up to the right people at the right level, you know, why would you want them to log into three or four different Jenkinses? Um, but maybe most importantly was one that we came out of in our own team. And as a QE, I want slaves to be on demand so that resources are used more efficiently. So we've got a few motivations here. Um, I mean, obviously, we've got some friction in the dev workflows. And when I say friction, uh, really it's, you know, I was talking about some of this uh, monolithic uh, job configs repositories or individual uh, pipeline configurations on a Jenkins. And those don't necessarily map well with topic branches or if testing needs to be changed between topic branches. So if you need to set up a separate pipeline for, you know, a new branch based on a release, uh, really you have to do a bunch of copying and pasting you have to have somebody make that change on a Jenkins or make it in a job configs repo. Um, meanwhile, devs are, you know, branching and merging all day. Um, why can't we follow their workflow? Why can't we work, you know, better with them and for their needs? Um, perhaps most importantly, uh, we really wanted an event-driven system. Uh, you know, how many people in here have seen the, the warning in the Jenkins management UI? that says, uh, you know, you have too many git polling jobs, you're polling too fast, and you've run out of threads. All right, no one. Okay, okay. well, we have that problem probably on half of our infrastructure, um, just because we want things like, you know, as close to on commit as possible, uh, and yet we're just overrunning it with the number of jobs that we have. We want to improve the reporting and user experience. You know, we want to be able to give the right people the right information when they need it, as opposed to, you know, somebody ask a question and it take us, you know, two hours to, to actually give them an answer because we have to dig into so many different systems. Um, but maybe most importantly, you know, we need to scale to meet the growing demand of the org. Um, statically partitioned clusters, you know, all managed with Puppet on individual VMs doesn't really work. But if we can have dynamic infrastructure using something like Mesos and on-demand resources, um, then we're really starting to get somewhere. 
So one of the things we identified uh, when we started this project was that you know, Marathon allows us to run applications statelessly. Um, in order to remove the state from Jenkins, we had to start looking at a few things. Um, you know, since everybody in the room is, uh, is comfortable and familiar with Jenkins, uh, I don't think this is any huge surprise, but um, let's just take a look at the, the different components that make up the monolith. You know, we've got our GitHub repo that, you know, just sits there and, you know, that's where our code lands. And we've got, you know, various web UI, we've got a, a REST API, um, we've got various plugins that store configurations on disk, we've got the job configuration management. Uh, we have a trigger, you know, polling, cron, um, you know, if you're using GitHub pull request builder, uh, you know, that's also the trigger. We've got a scheduler built into Jenkins that has its own queuing, uh, which hands off to remoting and actually giving a build to an executor and then passing that off to a Jenkins slave to actually be run. And then build info and results are also persisted to disk. So we've got this 15 different times. The problem is, in a typical scenario, it doesn't really leave any clear interaction points for developers. Um, you know, when you consider our organization and QB's trying to provide this as a service, you know, devs shouldn't be interacting with every little bit. They should be interacting with, you know, the things that we tell them they need to interact with, and we should be handling all the infrastructure pain for them. So, just to recap, in order to break up this monolith a little bit and, and remove state, we've got to handle job configurations, we've got to handle a build trigger, and we have to take care of build history. So, this is a, um, this is an example architecture that we came up with where the job configs are actually stored alongside the project repositories. Um, when a, a push or a PR occurs, a uh, webhook's fired to a hook processor, which is handed off to Jenkins and a, a job DSL seed job. Um, eventually, that'll be handed off to the, uh, the Mesos master will give Jenkins the resources it needs uh, to go ahead and spin up those slaves on demand. Now, the hook processor is gonna give a bunch of information about our repository and the event that just occurred um, and store that in Elasticsearch for later query. And Jenkins is also gonna ship all of its build data over into a database that we can then write an API and a web interface for. But really what it does is it, it allows us to have clear interaction points where developers are working, you know, in their project repositories with their job configs um, and they're using an API and reporting application without having to worry about the mechanics of the underlying infrastructure. So really our sysops team can provide Mesos as a service, we can build on top of it, and then our developers can actually do what they need to do instead of having to worry about the system itself. So like I had mentioned earlier, Marathon allows us to scale applications out horizontally and just say we want n instances of this app. Um, you know, it, it allows us to be able to deploy updates to the application, make configuration changes and plugins uh, in a very uh, standardized and, and systemic way. Um, but really, it might even give us continuous deployment of our own CI system, um, you know, with its own automated testing, which you just don't really get with static infrastructure. Um, you know, and, you know, I'm talking about scaling Jenkins masters horizontally and, you know, having them be stateless. And you might be wondering to yourself, you know, why would we do that? And if you get back to the single monolithic Jenkins master that has all of the jobs and it has one resource pool, if that goes down, 100% of your jobs can't run. You know, 100% of your in-flight jobs are dead in the water. But if we scale this out to five stateless masters on Marathon, um, it, that number goes down to 20% for one failure. Um, so this is just a quick graphic of what it looks like to run Jenkins on Marathon. So Marathon's registered as a Mesos framework. Jenkins is running on Marathon as any other web service. It's registered with Mesos as a Mesos framework and then it brings up these slaves on demand um, using the Jenkins uh, slave.jar. And then all of that data is shipped into um, Redis and ELK, which in this particular case is not running on Mesos, but there's no real reason that it, it couldn't. Um, and just to, uh, to give you an idea of what's actually going on with the, uh, the hook processor here, um, the job config is ending up on the uh, Jenkins master as a seed job. Um, pretty much the webhook hands off to the webhook listener, um, which queries Marathon for a healthy Jenkins instance. So really, it takes a look at the number of instances that are running, it picks a task, it tries to ensure that the Jenkins master is healthy, that it's actually returning a version. Um, it creates that seed job, which creates multiple uh, dynamic jobs to actually configure our pipeline. 
Um, and then all that shipped into an external data store. So really what we have is ephemeral pipelines based on the point in time and the branch for our individual project. So it allows QE to be able to branch off a, a project repo, make changes to CI, and test it out in a topic branch before merging it back into mainline. Um, so with that hook processor, you know, I, I just kind of said that it goes into a data store and you know, it's a little bit of magic. But uh, really what we have is for every event, every webhook that comes in, uh, we generate a UUID. And that's shoved into Redis based on the project repo um, and the namespace. So you know, let's say Puppet Labs Puppet. Um, and we just maintain that list to give us the arbitrary build numbers or a, a list of recent builds. Um, all of the webhooks and build data are then shipped uh, via Logstash into Elasticsearch so that we can query them a little bit later. Um, we can then query and visualize our system activity in Kibana, um, things like being able to search for number of successes and plotting that out over time, or number of failures, you know, do we experience more failures around a release cycle? Why is that? Um, but really, with all of this stuff being in its own database and queryable, um, you know, arguably outside of you know, Jenkins' uh, file system-based approach, uh, why can't we write our own reporting app? So this is just something that I hacked together um, just sort of for the purposes of this demo. Um, but we're able to just, we've got all this information and we can just present it in a really user-friendly way. So in this particular case, it looks a little bit like Travis CI, but uh, yeah, just a little bit of Twitter bootstrap there and uh, we've got a pretty nice looking UI. So I just wanna jump into a, a demo quick, um, just short, sort of showing all of this stuff in, in action and, uh, and really the power of it. Um, I went ahead and, and pre-recorded this quick, um, wasn't really sure what the Wi-Fi was gonna do here and I figured a bunch of you guys would probably wanna get out of here and, uh, and grab a beer and, and not sit around and watch our spec run. Um, so let's go ahead and walk through this. We've got a bunch of applications running on Marathon and uh, on Mesos. Um, Jenkins, the hook processor, uh, NGROC for actually handling the hooks, um, and then this experimental reporting app. So we've already got this, uh, this hook created uh, on the GitHub repo, and it just replied uh, upon. Uh, Jenkins is up and running. Let's just go ahead and, uh, and take a look at the, uh, the job DSL script that I'm talking about, uh, just in case you aren't familiar with the job DSL plugin. Um, but I mean, we're setting things like the job name. Um, create jobs allows us to actually clean up after the C job. Um, creating a matrix with various rubies. Uh, we've got the shell script in line, but you know, that could be a separate script itself. Um, we're gonna process the J unit output. We're gonna shove everything into a log stash. And we're actually gonna fire the job once this is created. And this was already committed, but I'm just gonna go ahead and, uh, and bump it anyway. So yeah, if we look here, the, uh, the seed job's already created. And, uh, and we saw that queue at the very end, so it's already triggered. So we've already got a, um, so the job's already in queue to go ahead and process that job DSL script. So Jenkins has spun up a, a dynamic Mesos slave, a dynamic Jenkins slave on Mesos. And it's just gonna go ahead and process that. It usually takes about a minute or so, but we're gonna skip past it. If we refresh the page here, we'll actually see that we've got this one new job. Um, you know, not a very complex example, but it's an example nonetheless. Um, there's the three rubies that, that we said in our multi-configuration project. If we come back here, uh, we'll actually see that um, we're gonna get some builds in queue in just a second. So the Ruby 200 build has already started and 193 and 215 are sitting in queue. And really what's happening is uh, the Mesos Masters are gonna offer up the, uh, the resources to Jenkins and it's gonna spin up some more of these, uh, these dynamic slaves. So we're running another job in a container and, uh, and that 193 job will, will kick off shortly and uh, it'll also be running on, um, in a container on one of these dynamic slaves. You can have multiple executors per slave. I just decided to limit it to one just to sort of illustrate the whole uh, dynamic slave concept. So 
So uh, we've already got one of the builds finished up. Uh, so that slave was just sitting idle uh, after whatever the termination timeout is. I think in this case it was about three minutes. Um, we went ahead and killed that off. So those resources are now um, freed up for another framework or another Jenkins master or uh, whatever other workloads are running on your Mesos cluster to go ahead and use. And uh, you know, just in the Mesos UI, we can see that that's already been killed off and we've still got two containers running. All right, so uh, just fast forwarded to the, uh, the end of the run here. And we'll see those, uh, those slaves drop off too, but uh, we don't have to stick around for that. So if we switch over to Kibana, um, Kibana is a, a nice front end for Elasticsearch. Allows us to, uh, to write some queries um, using uh, Lucene. So if we just uh, filter everything by timestamp, So we've got all this data, we've got our, our webhook payloads, we've got our build data. Um, we can go ahead and uh, select a specific source. So in this case, uh, let's select the, the source. Uh, the name of the, the hook processor was just Jenkins Hookshot, not very inventive. Um, but here we, we've got information, you know, such as the, uh, the seed job name, the, the Jenkins URL that actually ran the job, uh, the repository, um, who actually owns the repo, uh, some of the URLs to various things on GitHub, um, if we scroll down a little bit, we've got things like the sending, um, the sending repo, um, the before SHA, the after SHA, um, what the new head commit is. Um, we've got our commit messages, commit subjects, um, who actually authored and who committed uh, this particular SHA. And if we switch this back to Jenkins, uh, we'll have our build data here. And the, the Logstash plugin for Jenkins uh, gives us a whole bunch of information. Um, project success, what the, the access is, um, you know, the full display name with the UUID that we gave it, um, you know, the build variables, uh, just like, you know, Ruby 193. Um, yeah, if, if we look through uh, some of this stuff, I mean, we've even got test results. So we processed the, the JUnit output from our spec, and, you know, we can see that we had 43 skip test and, and about 19,000 successful. Um, any fail test would show up there. And then we've also got the entire build log. Um, and I guess the cool thing is, uh, you know, this particular project was tested at this shot, at this point in time, um, just based on uh, an event-driven system. And it's all sitting in Elasticsearch, uh, ready for us to query. It's not sitting on disk somewhere. And then this is just a, that quick little reporting app. It, it doesn't do a whole lot, but it's uh, taking the UUIDs and the projects in Redis and the recent builds and um, taking some of the data in Elasticsearch, uh, really using Redis as the lookup service uh, to go ahead and display a little bit about our, uh, our build here. So, cool. I probably just threw a whole lot of information at you. It's the end of the day. Uh, some of you tuning out. Um, let's just talk about, uh, let's wrap up and figure out uh, what we really saw here. We've got a single base Git workflow between development, QA, and QE. Uh, we've got standardized stateless Jenkins masters where we can have Marathon deploy changes to our Jenkins configuration or be able to scale those apps horizontally. Um, and every Jenkins master is going to look exactly the same. Uh, you know, yeah, you could go in and you could change it, but restarted the app. Uh, it's going to take care of that. Um, the Jenkins slaves are provisioned on demand using available resources from the Mesos cluster. And if there weren't any available resources, we'll just sit in queue on one of those masters uh, just waiting to run. Um, but as a bonus, maybe, uh, you know, we were talking about CI, but we also got a private platform out of it, Marathon. And, uh, and that's interesting for, for a couple things. Um, you know, we've got a number of internal apps, and a lot of them are stateless, or they have their own data stores, and they could really ease our deployment process and uh, we wouldn't have to necessarily worry about maintaining all of these static VMs and the ops team wouldn't really have to worry about maintaining user access and logging on all of them. And it really just gives us um, you know, a, a much nicer way to, uh, to interact with our services. Um, you know, we could have rewritten Jenkins from scratch as a you know, highly available Mesa scheduler, um, but the fact of the matter is the Jenkins plugin ecosystem is really rich. You know, we don't want to reinvent too many wheels. You know, if we can already use 
certain plugins for HipChat notifications or Slack notifications or you know, shipping all this stuff to Logstash or using the job DSL plugin to be able to put our configs in version control, uh, why would you reinvent all of that? Um, it sets us up to be able to, but we don't really need to. Um, so just a bit of future work, um, adoption. I mean, adoption with, with any sort of, you know, it, you don't really want to rip and replace infrastructure. So um, obviously everything here might not work for everyone else, but I mean, you could at least start by solving the static partitioning problem by using Mesos and then, you know, maybe start experimenting with running uh, Jenkins on Marathon in a, a way that might seem more sane to you. Um, I mean, that could be just committing your configurations to version control and running them as separate Marathon apps. Um, but anyway, it just kind of gives you a starting point and uh, a new way to think about operating uh, Jenkins as a CI service. Um, we saw a single reporting dashboard. Um, that particular app was also backed by the API. It was just in, in a single project. So, um, yeah, we, we've got um, intelligent job queuing and throttling. That, that's something that we've been talking about. Uh, a couple of our us infrastructure guys on the QE team, um, we've been thinking about being able to look at the load on our backend infrastructure and our uh, VM pooling service and be able to throttle builds or uh, hold builds in a queue before they hit the hook processor um, and actually get uh, created uh, as Jenkins jobs uh, just so that we don't overload um, an already you know, dire situation. And, you know, as you saw the job DSL, it was a little bit verbose, you know, there's you know, if you consider that across, you know, two, three, you know, 100 different projects, there's going to be a lot of repetition. So we've also been looking at uh, job DSL plugin abstraction and templates so that we can provide engineering with uh, various te um, templates that we've known are good for testing Ruby projects or C++ projects or uh, closure projects. And they can just provide some parameters on how they actually want their job to run. Um, but maybe most importantly, um, you know, Jenkins is still here. You know, it's still a component of the overall CI system. Um, and I don't really see that going away at any, any point soon. Um, and with that, uh, thank you for your time. And I'd like to open it up for a bit of Q&A if anybody's got some questions. Uh, yeah, and the, the blue striped shirt. Yeah, so the question was what plugin in Jenkins were we using to bring up the dynamic slaves and if the um, slaves already had Ruby and RVM and everything installed, right? Yeah, so um, we're using the Mesos plugin, um, which I believe came out of Twitter and uh, um, Venata and uh, his team has been maintaining. And as far as uh, Ruby and RVM, um, if you're using C groups, then yeah, you'll want those dependencies installed on your Mesos slaves. Um, we happen to have a dedicated Mesos cluster for build infrastructure. Um, but if you were to run it in a Docker container, you could bundle all of it up that way too. Um, and be able to have, you know, it might be a little bit nicer to be able to manage your Ruby runtimes in the Docker container as opposed to, you know, running it on a general purpose slave, especially if uh, the sysops team is providing it as a service to you and perhaps other customers. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was the, uh, the idle termination timeout for the, the Jenkins slaves, um, and if that was through Mesos. Uh, it's a feature that's built into the scheduler um, for Jenkins um, in that Mesos plugin. So it'll just look and see, you know, if a, a job hasn't run on this particular slave with this ID, um, it'll go ahead and terminate that task. So that's why we saw in the, the Mesos UI earlier that the task was killed. It wasn't just successful because the schedule actually killed it off. Um, it's just like a long running, uh, I guess a short running Jenkins slave. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was, um, you know, how do you tie builds uh, in a particular phase of a pipeline uh, to a particular uh, Jenkins agent? And um, one of the things that you can do with the Mesos plugin and the global config for Jenkins is you can define multiple uh, different kinds of Mesos slaves. 
um, with their own slave labels, or I'm sorry, Jenkins slaves um, with their own slave labels. And each one of those could have uh, different requirements, um, you know, different amount of CPU, different amount of memory, um, and it's just gonna wait for those resources to be offered up. Um, so it's pretty flexible. And then uh, along with the, the various different labels, uh, they could be different Docker containers as well. So, so we've got two questions. Uh, the first question was, um, what do we do with build artifacts? Uh, that's a fantastic question. <laughs> um, uh, so th this, is, uh, this has only been like a, the prototype phase, so we don't have a, a clear, um, clear way of handling build artifacts. Um, I mean, they could be stored on the master, they could be stored on a, you know, external uh, web server. Um, we haven't really gotten that far yet. Um, but the second question was, uh, was pretty interesting, and uh, I'm glad you asked. Um, and he asked, couldn't we just run each job on an ephemeral Jenkins master as opposed to playing with all the Jenkins slaves? Um, and the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, that's actually what we had started with, and we thought that it made a lot more sense as far as you know, the demo and as far as uh, trying to get people to adopt it, um, to be able to show the dynamic slaves, and um, really it applies to more um, of the scaling use cases, but yeah, there's really no reason that you couldn't do that. Um, and really, it gets rid of a lot of the overhead. Um, but that's an entirely new concept from the new concept that I just talked about. So uh, it was a little bit of a harder sell. Yeah, in the back. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, great question. So um, the question was, uh, how do we deal with OS 10 and Solaris and Windows and all that stuff in Mesos? Um, if you recall in the beginning, I also talked that we had, um, uh, we had a framework called uh, Beaker. Um, and what that does is it'll talk to VM Pooler and uh, over on vSphere we've got uh, pools of virtual machines running Solaris or OS 10 or Windows. Um, and what we would do is we would just use Jenkins as the execution engine and then run it on those disposable VMs and then destroy those afterwards. So a little bit more heavyweight, but it allows us to get rid of the static partitioning as far as our static Jenkins infrastructure is concerned um, and just bring a little bit more um, uh, dynamic resources to the mix. Oh, yes. Oh, uh, great question. So. Um, the question was, uh, what do we do with the, master, with the jobs that are created on each of these uh, ephemeral masters? Um, yeah, we could leave them there. They're never gonna do anything unless uh, we can figure you know, something like Git polling or, um, or cron, which uh, we specifically don't do. Um, but if you notice, in, early on in the job DSL script, I had this Boolean called create jobs, and I didn't really explain it too much. But what we could do is, um, this particular project, it's up on, uh, on GitHub, but we could rerun the seed job with a create jobs false parameter. And what's gonna happen is job DSL is gonna see that, oh, you know, I've created all these jobs but they're no longer in my configuration. So it'll go ahead and clean up after them and only leave the seed job left. So um, that's one way to do it or you could also just periodically uh, restart them as you push configuration changes. Um, are there any other questions? I think we've got time for maybe one more. All right, cool. Well, uh, thank you for your time. Um, the slides will be posted uh, if you're interested. Uh, I'm at Roger Ignazio on Twitter um, from Puppet Labs, and uh, thanks.